the European history with Dr. Brofkin, and today we will talk about Russia in this uh, during the times of uh, Reformation, the 16th century. What was going on in the east of Europe? Uh, and we haven't talked at all about Russia, so it needs some introduction, uh, a very basic introduction. Uh, so what, now we come to the 1400s. This is the time of the Renaissance in Italy. Uh, what does Russia look like at that time? There is no Russia yet. Uh, the, nominally, there's still... Uh, okay, I'm going to have to stop and ask. Uh, they, uh, they're they splintered into these small principalities, and little by little, Moscow, as Moscow prince, uh, asserts his dominance by clever manipulation of tax collection, by delivering it quicker and better to the Mongols, uh, and he kind of is uh, primus inter pares, which is first among equals uh, of these uh, Slavic princes. And then comes the important first name that is truly crucial, it's Ivan III, and he rules at the time of Italian Renaissance, in the middle of the 1400s. Now, if you recall, 1452 is the most important date in Eastern Europe, uh, and that's the conquest of Constantinople by the Turks. So the, the, the uh, center of Orthodox religion is no, longer, is no longer in the hands of the Greeks and Orthodox. It's taken over by the Muslims. And, uh, uh, and, and that creates a kind of a strange situation. Russia begins to, or Moscow, begins to feel that they are the, the ones that picked up the banner and that they keep up uh, sort of the center, being the center of the orthodoxy now that the Turks took over Constantinople. What really uh, moves this process further is the marriage of Ivan III to Sophia, uh, who was a niece of the last Byzantine emperor. So she was uh, the daughter of the brother of the last Byzantine emperor. She was brought up in Italy, but she was royal blood. I mean, she was basically uh, uh, the uh, Byzantine empress, I mean, uh, princess who uh, was uh, the, of the last reigning monarch. And, and she marries Ivan III. Uh, and that brings enormous changes to Russia. Uh, well, let's call it Moscow because that's what it was at the time. Uh, Sophia brings a, a lot of uh, Italian uh, customs, uh, architects. Uh, they, it, it, the Italians come with her and they spread their influence. So uh, the, the Moscovites begin to be familiarized with Italian ways and what's going on. And, and that process will continue. So if you look at the Kremlin today, uh, it looks identical to the one in Milan. Uh, it, it's pretty much the same. Or when we were in um, Bologna, uh, the, the city walls in Bologna look very much like in Moscow. It's because these were Italian architects that were building those for uh, the grandson of Ivan the Fourth, Ivan the uh, Third, who is known as Ivan the Fourth or Ivan the Terrible. So, one other thing that's credited to Sophia, uh, that uh, uh, her son Vasily uh, is the father of uh, Ivan the, the, the Fourth. Uh, um, apparently, she had an enormous influence in uh, disseminating the idea uh, that uh, Russia should be like Byzantine Empire, should inherit the uh, seat of orthodoxy. Uh, and. Uh, Basically, it happens in that Vasily adopts the title of Caesar. Uh, it's apparently his wife who has been telling him, you should be strong, you should be like, like the Byzant Byzantium used to be, you should be an emperor, uh, you should be a Caesar. And, and he does take that role uh, and this title. So the title Tsar is actually a Russian pronunciation of Caesar, uh, which means emperor. Uh, and that's the origin of the word. And it also creates a myth which kind of continues to a certain extent to the present time, uh, which is the expression, Russia is the third Rome. So that's a very important thing. What does it mean, Russia is the third Rome? Well, the first Rome is Rome. The second Rome is Constantinople. And the third Rome is Russia, meaning that uh, the Byzantine Empire continues 
in Russia as a seat of orthodoxy, uh, as the power that shifts to the north. Yes, Constantinople was taken by the infidels, by the, uh, by the uh, Turks, and we ourselves were under the Mongols, but Russia would rise again as it did from the Mongols, and it would be a new uh, orthodox uh, empire, like the Byzantine Empire used to be. So, uh, Ivan uh, Vasily, uh, the son of Ivan, takes this uh, title, uh, the Caesar, uh, but Russia is still nowhere close to being a Byzantine Empire or close to it. It's pretty much small. Its territory is basically uh, around Moscow. It's, that's what it's called, Moscovy. Uh, and uh, it still has very, very powerful neighbors. Each one of them is by far more powerful than Moscovy. So the neighbors are uh, the uh, Tatar states uh, to the east uh, along the Volga that are beginning to splinter into Astrakhan Khanate and Kazan Khanate and the Crimean Khanate. Uh, and these are all Muslim and these are all to the east and south. And to the uh, west, uh, Russia, well, Moscovy borders a huge and powerful state. Uh, which is uh, Rich Pospolita, which is a commonwealth of Lithuania and Poland, which is probably bigger at that time than Moscovy is. Uh, and as we discussed, it, it unites uh, in today's terms uh, Poland, uh, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, and northern Germany. And all of that huge state, bigger than Germany, bigger than Moscovy, is the uh, powerful neighbor to the west of Moscovy. And of course, to the south, Russia has an even more powerful neighbor, and that is the rising Ottoman Empire. Now, in, uh, at the time of Ivan, in 1480s, Ottoman Empire was just beginning. They, they were not really that powerful. Well, they were, but they were not a superpower. But by the time of Ivan uh, Vasily, which is early 1500s, uh, Vasily ruled from 1505 to 1533. This is the time of Suleiman the Magnificent. This is when uh, Ottoman Empire reaches its uh, most power and, and zenith of its cultural renaissance and its uh, military might. This is the time when Suleiman marches to Budapest and besieges Vienna. So this is the kind of a powerful neighbors that Vasily faces. Nevertheless, it is with Vasily that one could say there is a kind of a comeback of Russia as a modern independent state. Uh, it is stronger than its Tatar former rulers, uh, and, and that is a kind of a rebirth of Russia and its comeback to Europe as an independent and uh, equal, at least, uh, state as others. And, and, and now we come to uh, the reign of Ivan IV, who is known as Ivan the Terrible, but it's a wrong translation, it's not really uh, correct. Uh, the Russian expression is Grozny, which should be translated the awesome, or a person who inspires awe, that, which, is, which is wonder, which is glory, which is surprise, but not terror. In any case, uh, Ivan IV uh, is, is a Tsar, he's a Caesar, uh, and he actually is the first one who would engage militarily with the uh, uh, with the Ottoman Empire and win. Uh, that would be the first claim of Russian uh, military uh, significance. Uh, that was when the uh, uh, the Ottomans and the Russians fought in the uh, at, at the low edge of uh, Volga River, where it flows into Caspian, uh, and they won and and assur asserted Russia's entry into the Caspian by uh, by that victory. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there was absolutely, uh, Ottoman Empire was a superpower, controlling everything in the Mediterranean, controlling the territory from Budapest to India, uh, and uh, Moscovy couldn't be anywhere in that league. Nevertheless, uh, uh, Ivan I I I I was uh, a very successful ruler, and one of his most important successes is the conquest of Kazan, uh, which is the capital of Kazan Hanate in 1550. Uh, which is uh, really another reassertion of Russia as not only an independent state, but a powerful state. What's so important about the conquest of Kazan is that it could be compared to uh, 
the uh, Ottoman attempt to take Vienna, which is 1530, and um, Ivan takes Kazan in 1550. In both of these stormings of a city, they used explosives. Uh, the Turks would, uh, would put an explosive under the walls of Vienna and blow them up, uh, but the Viennese found a way to counteract it. Uh, so, so that also proves that Russia, uh, Moscovy, did have explosives, uh, and it was familiar with modern warfare, and it pr proved to be superior than uh, the um, uh, Hanate of Kazan. So with the conquest of Kazan, uh, Ivan really spreads Russia's rule to all of European territory, uh, and then pushes down the Volga River towards the Caspian Sea. Uh, he also had a successful war with uh, with uh, uh, the Poles, with the, with the Polish state, and pushes out towards the Baltic Sea for for a while. Uh, so, in other words, uh, militarily, uh, Muscovy under the first Caesar, uh, Ivan the Fourth, is uh, is is doing quite well. It is asserting itself uh, as a, uh, a powerful state, surrounded by even more powerful states. Now about domestic policies, uh, as we know, Holy Roman Empire was a bunch of principalities that were loosely united into an empire governed by an, by a, by an emperor who didn't have much power, and any one of those emperors, any one of those kings and dukes and others uh, could do whatever they please, and the emperor couldn't do it. Uh, now, the Caesar of Russia uh, decided that this is not his way. Uh, and he decided to concentrate power in a rough way. Uh, this is perhaps why he's called the terrible or the terrifying or the awesome. Uh, so the Russians, uh, Russian uh, local leaders were called boyars, and they were like dukes and herzogs in the Germany. They controlled the city and the territory around it. So he decided to smash them. Uh, and that was a spectacular operation of smashing the boyars. The way he did it was he would cre he created a, uh, a private army of his own, uh, and he started giving out lands to his servants, loyal officers, uh, lands conquered uh, from the uh, boyars. Well, remember Wallenstein did something like this. He would steal land from the Protestants and, and put it to his own use. Uh, but uh, Ferdinand didn't go all the way. If he had smashed Ferdinand and taken all the conquered lands into his own possession and established his own personal rule, that would have been similar to what Ivan IV did. He basically used these people, they were called Aprichniks, uh, Oprichnina is the territory controlled by personal servants of the Tsar. Uh, and he smashes out the boyars and establishes his personal control. So, in the, in the case of, uh, of Moscovy, we have a kind of a brutal assertion of the power of the Tsar over the nobles. This is uh, what the French king would try to do uh, under Louis XIV, and it would be an uphill battle and a very long one, which eventually the French kings would succeed. This is something that the German emperor never succeeded in doing, and German remained splintered into tiny little principalities all the way into the 19th century. And so, to conclude, Ivan IV uh, is a truly a great uh, Tsar from the point of view of Russian state. He uh, united all of the Slavic Russian territories into one. He actually started the process of uh, conquering the conquerors, which is the uh, Tatar-Mongol states on the periphery of Russia on the Volga River. Uh, and he actually was the first one to have a successful campaign against the Turks and a successful campaign against the Lithuanians. Uh, and that really brings a new powerful state onto the stage of European politics, uh, which is still called Moscovy. Thank you.